Hey guys. So, a bunch of you answered uh, the survey which I sent out, which really helps because it frames sort of context as to what things you might like to hear about and what things don't interest you at all. So we'll try and focus on those today. Uh, so uh, from what I sent out, pretty much the majority of you have not programmed on a microcontroller before, so a lot of what I'll talk about will probably just go right over your head. So I'll try to keep it as abstract as possible and perhaps we can just talk about where it might be applicable in the uh, biomedical industry in the years to come. Uh, you have, I asked you which industry are you most interested in, and uh, healthcare, was, uh, healthcare was the most dominant one, so we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll go through a couple of use cases uh, that Kiwi has explored ourselves, and we can kind of talk about the healthcare industry in terms of wearable technology today and where it might go in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, so on and so forth. Okay, so key points that I'd like to address today, sort of an industry to explore, uh, healthcare, uh, the importance of placing a sensor on a person and the accuracy associated with that placement, uh, types of models that can be developed to understand different types of movements or patterns from uh, biosignal data, uh, the limitations of working a, in an embedded environment, and the importance of testing. So, all of these sort of industries here uh, we've explored uh, with Kiwi, but I'll focus sort of on the uh, on the medical uh, space because that's sort of more applicable to yourselves. Uh, the first one is kind of interesting. It's uh, pa uh, patient authentic authentication. So this can be uh, understood in two contexts. Let's say uh, I'm wearing an activity tracker, and my insurance company gives me uh, sort of like a discount on my premium if I walk a minimum of 10,000 steps per day. So I could be like a normal person and I could go for 10,000 steps per walk or I could try to game the system and I could put my activity tracker on a dog and let my dog go run around. So where's the discrepancy or the difference in that? Um, that's sort of the patient authentication. Uh, what we've done there is with an accelerometer and a gyroscope, you can actually uh, determine or describe, uh, determine the let's say uh, the 51st person in a group. So if you have a population of data, then you can determine the outlier of that data and ensure that it is actually that person that is walking day over day. And they're not putting it on their dog or they're giving it to their kid to wear and run around. So the second one is uh, fall detection. So that's pretty, uh, it's a pretty well explored use case uh, in the use of accelerometers and uh, what's possible there is sort of real time relay of information. So let's say I were to give a little pendant or a wristband to my grandmother and she wears it and it's connected to some sort of smart hub. Any time that she falls or she's too stationary for a long period of time, uh, a notification could be sent to my phone. Um, the problem here with a lot of these use cases is getting the elderly person to actually wear the, wear the device. So it's user adoption. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to introduce a new technology to someone that is gone their entire life kind of adverse to technology or they prefer to just talk to people or things like that. So that's the largest barrier to entry in the uh, medical space. Um, and the last uh, sort of use case and probably the highest potential in most applicable to yourselves is rehabilitation. Uh, so understanding movement patterns to better rehabilitate, let's say, athletes or a person that's in a car accident, um, if they have a certain a type of like a strain on the muscle, there's certain exercises that they need to do and they have to repeat them a certain amount of times. You can use an accelerometer and gyroscope device to ensure that those exercises are actually being performed properly. So it can uh, add a lot of value to uh, the practitioner and the person actually wearing the device. So it's sort of a win-win scenario. And they're also a bit more cost tolerant to uh, having a device uh, at like, let's say a higher price point that will provide them some value. Or it could be actually included as part of their, um, uh, let's say their like insurance plan, what have you. Cool. So now let's talk about accuracy and placement of sensors. 
So current uh, machine learning uh, models for activity trackers sit between 60 to 70 percent accuracy in like a real world world test. So while I'm wearing this Fitbit right now, uh, as I'm just kind of waving my hand talking to you, it's actually counting steps. And if I were to wear and continuously kind of wave in this sort of rhythmic pattern over, let's say, a two or three minute window, it would actually presume that I'm walking, not even though I'm just staying stationary, because they're only looking at uh, kind of a kind of a pendulum pattern with your wrist. And if that happens again and again, then you'll end up with this classification state of walking. So really understanding where the limits are or what does your data model define for the activity you're trying to track. So uh, throughout this, I'll just sort of use walking as the example because it's, uh, it's quite easy one to understand. There's lots of uh, overlap between different motions and uh, it's probably the most common thing that we do, we all do every day. Um, higher accuracy is needed for healthcare because to ensure, let's say, with insurance or uh, with uh, detection of uh, falls or sort of more life concerning events, uh, higher accuracy higher accuracy is needed so that people don't game or falsify something that is uh, there to improve their life. Um, so now let's talk quickly about the location. Uh, if you were to place a sensor on the wrist, uh, the positives associated with doing that, you've got uh, sort of a bit more tolerance for the individual because they're able to uh, do something that they're already accustomed to, like let's say wearing a watch. Uh, the problem with that is there's a lot of overlapping uh, nature of movement. So um, if I move my hand like left to right or up and down, that could be very easily interpreted for walking as well because I could be walking and waving to you at the same time, but it should still detect that I am walking. Uh, in case. Um, another location is uh, along the waist. Uh, so this is going to guarantee a much higher accuracy, and it's been proven long ago. Uh, there's, you know, in a Kellogg's uh, box, you could get a step counter that just has like a little pendulum in it. It's pretty accuracy. The main thing that companies like Fitbit did uh, was basically digitize that step counter that was in a box to connect it to your phone, which makes sense because then you have day over day logging of your information. Uh, the negative, it's a new habit for people to do and in any sort of application of technology in an actual consumer space, the hardest thing that you're gonna overcome is perhaps encouraging that new habit or that transformation of what you think is the best case for them and they're gonna tell you something completely different. So balance those two. Um, do you guys have any questions? This, uh, oh, this this is coming from uh, customers that work with. So like a customer wouldn't feel comfortable using this unless it was at least 85% accurate? Yep, so, like, it's, so they, they want to have a baseline agreed upon accuracy under two testing scenarios, uh, which I'll talk about later, but the two are uh, like a use case specific for their needs. So let's say it's for uh, a senior hero. Uh, so they know the majority of the time they're either watching TV, they're walking, little bit or if they're laying in bed or sitting in a chair, then the use case would context those movements and as long as the accuracy is relative to sort of that every day to day uh, space, then the accuracy is acceptable. Okay. They wouldn't take into account, let's say, playing baseball or, I don't know, uh, doing cartwheels, things like that. This is not really relevant. Yeah, okay. I actually have another question. Yep. Um, what about the last slide, Bill? Yep. Um, like, how did you guys value these parameters? Like, I just go ahead and say, like, a basketball free throw evaluation is worth 10 million bucks. So, the, so there's, a, there's an industry report uh, provided by Gartner oh, every year, okay. and they give uh, overall um, valuations to uh, industries. And then what we did is we sub uh, provided, like, a sub component analysis based on, let's say, percent of population that plays a sport. Sure. And then that's how we got. What about 
overcoming privacy concerns because you know keeping you sleep or if you have some kind of intense activity in the night, uh, couples. So how do you overcome those kind of stuff? Uh, so the, the way that we found that works really well for privacy is everything is opt-in. So uh, any choice that's made by an end consumer, they're, they're very cognizant that as soon as they choose to share or capture this information, they're opting into it. They always have the option to turn it off or to anonymize that information, but to remove certain like events like that you might not want to be transparent, it's very difficult to, to do that. So it's just making sure that each individual person is given upfront the choice to do something, yes or no, and then they can always turn it off. Um, to try and remove every little nuance or to try to protect, protect that, it's very difficult to, to do. Uh, at least right now with the computing power available. Uh, Okay, fun stuff. Uh, developing a model. Uh, so there's kind of four steps uh, that are needed. Uh, you collect or process original data. So what that means is, let's say 10 of you in this room would wear an accelerometer-based device on their wrist and they would go walk 100 steps. And then we collect that bucket of data for those 10 people. We have that and have that available to be processed. We would then simulate that data to a larger population uh, based on a kind of known variation in movement. So you, let's say you have a population of 10, you could make that a population of 1,000 uh, by adjusting those 10 people's variations of steps by understanding that some people walk a bit slower, some people walk a bit faster, some people rotate their wrist more, some people lift their arm up a bit more. Those can all be done with kind of taking that original data and uh, simulate a larger population body. Uh, what's then next is you take that same subset of 10 originally and you collect variations in the movement. So let's say I'm walking traditionally, or I walk with my hand in my pocket, or I walk while holding my phone, or I walk while holding my phone like this, or walk while holding a bag, or holding my backpack, those are all variations that you would need to account for in building a data model if it is associated with your defined use case. Um, so collecting that data, then you repeat uh, steps one and two to have a larger population of data, and the last step is you would generate a data model, which we'll go into, uh, from that population of data. So really, the bulk of the work in developing any sort of good model is collecting the data and labeling it properly. It's arguably the hardest part. A lot of the, there's a lot of tools available now uh, that can leverage the mathematics side, uh, but having properly collected data and labeled is kind of at the forefront of a lot of challenges in the wearable space for developing good products. Um, okay, so we'll talk about quickly about the types of uh, algorithms that can be used with that data to extract, and I'll touch briefly on the limitations associated with each and the advantages as well. Uh, so the first one is uh, pattern matching. Uh, this can be used with like a template or something called dynamic time warping. Basically what this is, is if you have a window of time, let's say one second of data, and you label that one second of data as walking, then you feed in a queue of data into uh, a processing environment, you're able to match or compare that template of data that you've stored in some sort of processing array to that real-time buffer that comes in, and you are essentially just looking for a match to see the distance in that real-time buffer relative to your template of data, how close they are together. So in the case of dynamic time warping or other template-based approach, the closer that you are to zero, the better the result is because you've now got a closer match. So that's, uh, that's the essence of pattern matching. It's uh, arguably a lot of limitations with it because if that template of data is only applicable to one type of movement, 
then you're only going to be able to account for that one type of variation. So uh, it's very limited. Uh, it can yield a very high accuracy if you're looking for um, a very specific nuance of movement, and then you can extract that from data. So it's very valuable. There. So let's say you have an electrocardiogram, and you're trying to uh, determine uh, a certain arrhythmia in a heartbeat, and there's a certain type of uh, waveform that you're looking for, you could use pattern matching or dynamic time warping to extract and find those nuanced patterns very quickly. Um, it's also very computationally intensive, so uh, it's not really suggested for real world applications because of the battery or drain on the device. Um, the second one is uh, machine learning uh, data models. Uh, so basically what this is, is taking uh, a series of statistical values from, uh, let's say, a template of data or like a period of information to create a mathematical representation of what that queue of data or segment of data means. So does that mean what is the average of all the values uh, in that buffer? What is the variance amongst those values? If you have two axes of information, what is the covariance uh, between those two axes? You would use those numerical identities to create essentially features that you would learn a model about. So in the example here in uh, B, uh, this is walking and other movement. So let's say blue is walking and red is other movements. And this axis is the mean or the average of a buffer of different variations of walking. And this is the <coughs> variance of that buffer. You would plot all of the buffers of the vari variations of movement on this plot, this two dimensional plane. And you would create a model that basically addresses this section here as walking and this section here as other movements. And if any segment of data when you're processing falls into one of these two sections, then you would identify, classify that movement as uh, walking or other. Uh, the last one uh, is uh, neural networks. It's kind of an extrapolation of creating a data model uh, from features. It allows for, um, you can think of it like a three-dimensional space on a 2D plane. So you allow for more interconnections or probabilities for each uh, classification to occur. Uh, the mathematics behind a neural network is similar to how your brain processes information. So if you have different uh, points in space and you are trying to, or if you have different nodes in your mind and you're trying to make decisions on information based on the probabilities that rest in those nodes, a neural network is essentially allowing you to create a digital form of those nodes to make classification decisions. So saying it yourself, I would classify yourself as wearing a Detroit Tigers baseball cap and you've got a yellow t-shirt on. Great. Those are kind of visual characteristics that I can immediately apply to yourself. Um, you guys have questions about this? Yeah, it, like, it's pretty complex. Uh, people spend like tens of years studying each of these fields. So. Or decades, <laughs> so uh, yeah. The neural networks is kind of the forefront of that work. Um, a lot of things that you might implement or you might encounter in work if you ask, if you're to create uh, a wearable application in the future, most likely the core mathematics that will be utilized is a neural network. Uh, so, like, what kind of uh, features do you look for if you're using your like, neural networks and machine learning? Yeah, there's a variety of different, I mean, there's, you can come up with thousands of mathematical features, but to start with, uh, for the purpose of an embedded system, I just try to just use as simple features as possible. So using just like a mean, or using a standard deviation of space, or using um, 
like estimate the slope or the average slope of all the values in the space. Uh, and the reason that you do that is the complexity of the computations that you perform. Let's say you're trying to only do linear operations, which would be ideal on an embedded system. As soon as you do on squared operations or on cubed, you're gonna slow down your system, reduce the capacity to provide a real-time classification, and you'll probably end up with more errors because on an embedded environment or processing information on like a watch, there's a lot less flexibility in uh, error. So you're also, when you end up going into, let's say, um, are you using fixed point implementations? So the accuracy degrades if you use more complex features. So on the 10th, the 10,000th, uh, like 0 0.0001 decimals, if you cap at that, so there's some mathematical features that you need to the millionth sort of uh, space. So uh, balancing uh, with more simplified features first, and then you can kind of uh, increment the more complex uh, as you go on. Actually, another question. Yep. Um, uh, I know like with machine learning neural networks, like um, if you like write the computer, like a typical language would be like Python, you can look at libraries and stuff. But for embedded systems, it's much smaller. Like I would imagine you can't have like such a high level language probably use like C and like assembly to like get around like your resources. So how do you like go about using machine learning with like yep. simpler libraries if you use simpler libraries? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so you, you can use like a Python library for like scikit-learn to train a, a data model. Then basically it's just understanding the map well enough to create a C library that allows for the processing of that data model that you create. So you create and train the data model in your server environment with the standard tools from scikit-learn or wherever, and then you have to transcribe the outputted data model to the embedded environment. Uh, and that's the main value that Kiwi provides. That's what we do is we take, we train these data models and then we create custom C so you guys take all your data from your devices, send it up to the server and yep. send it back. So like uh, if you don't have Wi-Fi or like an internet connection or something, no, uh, so we'll make like a static library that goes onto the embedded device, and then we can update that static library on some periodic basis. Let's say it's on a monthly basis or a year. I mean, people don't really care after you've got uh, the base accuracy there. So maybe you do one update after. Yep. In terms of now, if uh, we are looking at using this uh, to provide the future real-time transmission of data for, say, disease diagnostics. Or yes. Uh, um, um, uh, a dynamic monitoring of specific parameters. Yes. Uh, how would you go about choosing the percentage of training data in a real-time fashion yep. with respect to the test data and the validation? Uh, yep, we usually try to use an 80-20 rule. Always. It's roughly that. 80% uh, training, 20% uh, testing. Uh, and then we'll do, so that's on like the server environment testing. Uh, but the more valuable tests that occur are the real world tests. So you, uh, you can test as much as you want in like a server environment, but until you actually get people to wear it and see how it really performs, then it, there's no real, yeah. The value gets decreased and decreased the more you just try to live in a simulated environment. So any advice I can give to you guys, that you, things that you might build, do real world tests as quickly as possible. Anything else? Uh, like one quick question. Yep. I used to graduate in like 2011. Um, is that like a bachelor's or like your master's or something? I did bachelor's. Okay, so then um, I'm, since you're like CTO, like I'm guessing you can kind of implement all the machine learning stuff. Like where'd you go about learning it? Uh, I've been programming since I was maybe like six. So, so this is just like something of interest. Cool. Okay. So algorithm development. Uh, so we sort of touched a bit on this, so I'll go over it uh, a bit quicker. Um, there's three main steps uh, to developing an algorithm. Uh, first step is filtering data. So you can use filters, uh, like low pass, band pass, high pass filters to remove noise uh, along a certain frequency. So if you know there's a certain operation that's occurring or if you want to remove 
remove slight jitter from a movement like bouncing your wrist like this, you can almost remove that noise completely by using a filter. Uh, so that's the first step that we applied to data, and we define that filter. Uh, the second is uh, feature extraction. So it's coming up with those features that will describe uh, that segment of data. And the last step is generating a model based on those features. Uh, so here, uh, again, it's just different clusters of data based on two features. And then uh, each of those features are, one of them is like a low pass filter uh, with a mean or like average of data and there's certain plot tendencies. Then we take those plots and generate a cluster to, or a kind of region that is applicable to those plots. Um, the overview, oh, and I guess our other uh, customer, which is a much longer lead uh, of sale, is new product development teams. So let's say there's a company that's looking to make a smart version of a piece of sports equipment. Let's say it's Bauer Hockey, they're trying to make a smart hockey stick. Then we would be providing this toolkit of kind of machine learning and sensor recognition tools to them to create their new product, but their product life cycle for these R&D teams is like two to three years. So it's very long lead. They have no control over when they're going to release a product and what might be the drivers for actually uh, uh, releasing that product. Um, to overview, what does the company do every day? <laughs> and the accomplishments the key. Um, <laughs> we're a very like, uh, results-oriented uh, company, but very full well. So, we just ensure that we issue builds, we test them, and then we release them to our customers as quickly as possible. Um, probably release, on average, two builds a day to customers. Uh, just because now we've got the core of our technology uh, built, a lot of it is just testing and kind of intaking data, or collecting more data, intaking it, building a model, transcribing it into an embedded environment. So the process is pretty, uh, fairly concise. So we can do that pretty um, who your clients in the uh, healthcare field? Uh, what are the most common variables that they want to measure? Um, so, a lot of the healthcare use cases that we've explored, we've done very short kind of test case projects with healthcare companies, but the roadmap or the product roadmap for them uh, and us being a startup is too long. Uh, so, they have uh, a healthcare company might have a product roadmap or an interest in creating a smart activity tracker for nurses, uh, nurses, let's say, or nursing staff, but their timeline to implement is five to 10 years. So as a business, we can have a small like education conversation with them, but the focus of our time uh, is on activity tracking and sort of health and wellness applications. So new product companies or these semiconductor businesses, which are actually putting new microcontrollers in the market, they release microcontrollers twice a year, and they're trying to release new microcontrollers with sensor recognition in them now. So that's the uh, reason for that. Uh, I would imagine we'll come back to the healthcare space in maybe a couple of years. Be more focused on that. Um, how do you define with prosthesis design? Uh, we're not currently doing that. It's very costly to do that. There's a company in Toronto that's kind of interesting that has gone through this. Uh, they started in 2012, they're called Bionic Labs. Um, yep, two smart guys as well. They started from uh, Ryerson University uh, and they built, uh, they're now a publicly listed company uh, on the TSX, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, but it's, they haven't released a product to the market yet. It, is it AV Bionics? No, uh, Bionic Labs. Bionic Labs. Yeah. Uh, okay, how does QE differ from all the accelerometer motion based fitness activity trackers on the market? We only provide the software. So we're not a hardware company, we're just doing the sensor intelligence. Uh, so, uh, is QE looking to incorporate its technologies with the upcoming virtual reality gaming industry? Uh, yeah, it's arguably one of the most kind of uh, enjoyable or kind of fun things that we can explore. Uh, we'll be doing an interesting like mixed reality demonstration uh, demo at CES uh, that mixes 
uh, movement and biosignal patterns. Uh, so uh, I can send you guys a link to that video when it's available. But I mean, that pretty under wraps for the moment. Um, what kind of skills and class qualifications should a potential employee have to work for you? <laughs> We're pretty focused on people that can show things that they've built and demonstrate provable outputs. So uh, anyone that we've hired to date has basically come to us with something that they've worked on personally in the space and really cared about, but they've shown that they're able to apply their knowledge very concretely uh, in a uh, proficient And yes, we tried to build your own uh, motion activity tracker, how can we get started? Uh, we have like a developer version of our library available uh, at this point. Um, it only works with Android or iOS phones, and it just tracks the bicep curl, but it's something quick that you can try out and test with if you're really interested in building something. Cool. Um, you guys can email me questions if you have them, and yeah. You guys have any other questions? So you said that your company kind of focuses on like the software of like um, getting sensor data and then like <coughs> algorithms like uh, generate patterns and models from those. Do you see yourself like branching out from active V tracking and just using your like expertise and general like sensor recognition for other applications like in the future? Oh, totally. Yeah. So like that's I've got a wide variety of those explorations. We did an interesting one around uh, understanding color patterns. Uh, from an EEG sensor, so how a person stares at the colors uh, red, green, and yellow, and being able to differentiate those. So anytime you stare at uh, the color red, what are the, let's say, show you a gradient of different colors, capture those signals, and then also use trigger words to see how your brain responds to, uh, let's say, things that are colored red. So if you say red car, if you say apple, if you say, red slushy or things like or cherry slushy, those things give off a certain signal, which are also indicative or descriptive to the word red. Uh, so we built a model around that, and what we found with the current resolution of sensors today, uh, you're able to build, let's say, a 70% accurate model on an individual by individual basis. So you'd have to go through this training process for each individual person, and then it would work for you but it couldn't be generalized to like the entire class. That's just for it's that's good. Anything else? Yeah. You guys were like in like EEG sensing, like did you guys like kind of make your own or did you buy one? Oh, we just used, uh, there's a couple different uh, companies in the market. There's one called Cognionics in uh, San Diego. Uh, they make more medical or a bit of a higher grade EEG helmet. Then there's a Muse in Toronto. They have like a little, uh, headband, it's like $300. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, so, like, I get that there's probably like a really like, difficult timeline for you guys to operate with, like, within the healthcare industry. Are there, like, is that, like, generally the case that you've seen with them? Or, like, are there things that they're willing to implement, like, relatively quickly? Uh, that's generally the case that I see. To actually end up with uh, an end product that is used by patients or healthcare practitioners, yes. Uh, might be a bit more flexible on like data entry software. So if you were to just use, create some sort of software that a doctor could log information into, might be a bit more pro. But as soon as it becomes something that people have to wear or things like that, then you've got a product life cycle to actually get that approved by the FCC yeah. uh, and there's medical clearances and things like that. So, um, it's a little bit of a personal question. Sure. Like, did you go straight into this right after graduating? Oh, no. No, I did, uh, uh, I did a few things, a few different experiments. Uh, I worked in the film industry for uh, like eight or nine months just for kicks, something I've always wanted to do. Um, I tried to start a, another business around understanding heart rate and skin resistance patterns to have um, experiences catered to you based on your biosignals. So 
like a choose your own story, but based on your emotions. Yeah, a bunch of other stuff too, but those are probably the most applicable to this. And the reason that the film industry is really applicable is it's understanding people in, like I came from a technical background, but I didn't have a good understanding of how um, people in the arts or in the art space interact and work with each other and things that might not be as technologically, uh, like they're not as cognizant of the engineering side. So to have a good understanding of that kind of complementary environment, I wanted to have sort of a balanced view to the world. So that's the reason for that. So if you're looking at hiring a full-time employee or yeah. co-op students, uh, yeah. we'd like to extend an invitation to come and visit us on 23rd of November this month. Um, okay. Just three weeks from today. Um, there are about 32 groups. We'll be uh, giving a demo of different prototypes. Okay, cool. All right, I'll do my best. I may not be here. Uh, but, uh, so somebody. Yeah, I'll see if I can send someone as well. Follow up next week. So, like, right now on your company stage, like, are you looking to hire or are you, you kind of like um, set with like your employees now? Or you uh, like our, employee? our employee pool is set for until. I would say May of next year. So May 2017? May 2017 will be the next time that we want to do any hiring. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Please join me in thanking our speakers.